Acts here. One, he, he interprets, of course, Clement much like he interprets Paul and the other New Testament uh, authors um, by assuming, in my estimation, he's assuming that if somebody uses the word elect or the number of the elect or something of that nature, that they must be talking Calvinistically. Now, did I ever say that Clement was a Calvinist? I've never said it. I've never suggested it. Anyone who listened to what I said, when I'm, whether I'm talking about Clement, whether I'm talking about the Epistle Diognetus, what have I always said? What do I say about all church writings? You have to let the fathers be the fathers. I have demonstrated this in debate with people from many different perspectives for decades. Why misrepresent me? I'm not saying he was a Calvinist. What I am saying is there's certain people out there that are promoting the idea that everybody in the early church had the exact same view on this topic. And that's you guys. That's not me. You're the ones that are making the argument. And I'm going, huh, doesn't seem like this was the same thing you're saying. Seems like this could mean something. Seems like someone writing a doctoral dissertation might want to have looked at those sections in the Epistle to Diognetus. Maybe you might want to talk about the number of the elect. Maybe there's something more to be said here. We're the ones responding to your argumentation and you're dodging and ducking. And of course, that's question begging. The, 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 debate, the, the point up for debate is what is meant by uh, the authors of Scripture, and thus Clement as well, uh, someone who uh, was along there with the uh, authors of Scripture at the same time that they were. What is their meaning when they reference the elect? Now, the one who was with them, that would mean the real Clement, <laughs> which would mean you just demonstrated that it's important to look at him, not somebody 300 years later, 200 years later, right? You just, did you catch that part? Um, yeah. Anyway, well, you should have caught that part because it's sort of important. Uh, they're just not being honest. Obviously, we all have our theological baggage. We have our presuppositions. We have the things that have influenced us from our perspective, um, and we all have to acknowledge that. Yep, and that's why you do exegesis. Not only the biblical text, but that's why you handle patristic evidence with great care, because it is far too easy to read into People who came before you are a reflection of yourself. And you know why I am loath to do that? Because I've had to debate all sorts of people who were doing that. When I, one, of the, one of the things that was echoing in my mind, I remember right now, I'm, I'm seeing the room. Well, before it went dark, thanks to a certain Alan, but I'm seeing the room in Seattle. And I'm debating a man who's much more intelligent than I am. John Dominic Crossan, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. He, IQ off the charts. Really is. And I'm debating him. And I'm sitting here, I'm looking at, I can see my notes. I think I had them on a computer. And the thought is going through my mind over and over again. I had read it in a book, so I didn't develop it myself, but it was so brilliant. And it was the reality that the people in the historical Jesus movement and, and crossing would be sort of the radical edge of that one. Um, because they have such a disdain for the historical sources as to anything supernatural in it, whatever they, it, it's like, it's like when they're looking down a well and when their eyes adjust to the gloom, they think they see Jesus, but what they're actually seeing is their own reflection in the water. And that's what these people end up doing. They see in history, they fill in the gaps because they don't believe that there's a consistent viewpoint anyways. And that's how history can be abused. And so we all have our theological baggage. No two ways about it. That's why you have to have consistent hermeneutical principles and consistent historiographical principles. Absolutely important. And so anytime you hear James White or others say, well, this person's coming to their conclusion because of their tradition or because of their presupposition, um, well, we could turn that around and say the exact same thing back to James White. We can say, well, you're coming up with your interpretation because of your Calvinistic tradition. If I did not provide the stuff you call red herrings, then you'd be right. I provide the context. I provide the background. I provide the consistent method of interpretation that I would use for each one of these sources. You don't. You just throw it out there. That's the difference. Um, and that's just a question begging argument. It's the it's a very low form of debate. It, it's kind of like low the form. playground, uh 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 kind of back and forth. Because it, again, any any 
question begging is anytime you can just repeat what the, the your opponent says and you can just repeat it back to them without changing a word, you can know that's that's a question begging argument. And James White uses that quite regularly in his uh, his discussions. And so what I so, wanted to do is play a portion at least. So I I I was just accused of using question begging all the time on this program. Anybody who listens to it knows that's a false assertion or he doesn't understand what it is. In fact, the thing I'm normally faulted for is going into too much detail to provide the very foundation for not doing question begging. So this is the pot calling the kettle black in a major, major, major way. What is most likely the appropriate uh, interpretation of Clement in the context of Clement's writings? And so let's go through some of that. Yes, that's a, that, see, that's the right way to do it. I just point out, there aren't any writings to do that with. There's just one. Don't you remember the debate? I asked you. So you, you said that he had many writings. What, what many writings are you referring to? You didn't know. I don't know that you know now. It's frustrating, Leighton, because you're still going, I'm the one making the errors. And then you can say stuff like that? <laughs> it's not the way it was understood throughout Old Testament times. Even though Paul interpreted it that way. Okay, so... Now, this is fascinating. Because he's actually going to accuse me of promoting apostolic eisegesis. Because what I have said is, isn't it tremendous when we get to have apostolic exegesis of Old Testament texts? So when... Well... Phone call earlier in the program, Romans chapter 4, quotation from Psalm 32, you get apostolic interpretation. You get apostolic interpretation of Genesis 15, 6. We can look at it. When was that in the timeline of Abraham's life? How is this relevant to the doctrine of justification? Remember the phone call? It's coming up on, you know, an hour ago now. Um, so when we have apostolic interpretation of Old Testament texts, that is an inspired interpretation, and that is a vital, vital element of New Testament studies. I have never suggested that the apostles are eisegeting. In fact, I have defended the apostles against the allegation of eisegesis, especially in regards to what? This is, again, where when you're, when you're a one-string banjo, that one string is going to wear out. But I have defended apostolic exegesis of Old Testament text against Jewish objections in regards to the messianic prophecies of Jesus. Michael Brown and I did an hour and 20 minute long program going through Isaiah 53. But there are so many other texts where you, they're directly quoted in the New Testament and you have an apostolic interpretation. That's an inspired interpretation. Now, sometimes that really throws us curves because then we have to wrestle with what is said. But the point is, the New Testament provides that light. That's going to be turned here into the idea that what I'm saying is we should eisegete. The Old Testament. He says, he's quoting, he's playing my opening statements from the debate. And um, and so I'm pointing out that no one has interpreted election in this way that Augustine does, uh, not in Old Testament times. And then, of course, he's making the comment, well, Paul quoted from Old Testament. Now, remember, in his debate with Steve Tassi, as well as in his debate with me, um, both times he says, well, the, these guys over there, non-Calvinists, they want to run to the Old Testament. They want to run to the Old Testament quotes to see what they said there. So what I was saying is that what they're doing is they will go to Old Testament passages to come up with an interpretation that disagrees with Paul's interpretation. They actually want to disagree with the apostle. Um, you want to disagree with the apostle? Or are you saying your interpretation is better than the apostle? No, what I'm saying is when we have an Old Testament text that's interpreted by an apostle, I think it's good to go with the apostle. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and I, I don't remember. I've never, I have actually honestly never listened to the Steve Tassie thing. <laughs> I just, sometimes I think it was just a bad dream. Got some, got some bad beef that night and 
<laughs> instead of looking at, quote unquote, the apostolic interpretation. So what James White is saying there, he did this with John Cramon in the debate on Unbelievable as well. Um, it, Who? What? Oh, OK. All right. Now, I, now, I, OK. This this concept or idea that 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 Paul is ultimately taking these quotes from the Old Testament and he is eisegetically reading a new doctrine into them and saying, even though it didn't it didn't mean this then when he quotes from it, he's he's using his apostolic interpretation. He's taking this quote from the Old Testament and he's using it to establish a new understanding or a new theology. Um, and that's ultimately what White requires that that Paul is doing. Baloney. We can go on from there. <laughs> that's just all it is. There are some things that are just so wrong, so completely misrepresentational, so straw man. You know, I need I need some matches. I need I you don't know, you're not allowed. Go get it, man. I think this is time. I think it's time. Finally, ready. Uh, you got it. You got. <laughs> uh, Leighton, Leighton, Leighton. Yeah, and this is another thing he just brought up recently in Twitter, pointing out somebody's um, uh, inability or lack of ability uh, is just a fact of the matter. So if you have somebody who is being deemed a scholar or somebody uh, that other people are referencing as their scholar or source. Then, uh, just like in a, uh, a you know in a courtroom, if you if if the uh, defense attorney attorney puts up a a, a, uh, a witness who is an expert in a particular field, then the then the DA can cross examine that that expert's ability and their capabilities because they're being put up as the expert. Now nobody's putting up little old Leighton Flowers as the expert on all of these things. Which is why you're doing 57 minute long videos on these things. No, you are putting yourself out there, sir, whether you want to admit it or not. And what he's talking about is uh, Leighton Flowers put out a, a tweet where he described Augustine as a former Manichaean heretic um, who knew hardly any Greek at all. Now, why do you think he'd put that out there? Do you think I'm just relating, you know, the, the factual data? No, it was an ad hom against Augustine. And my response was, you don't seem to know Greek any better than Augustine did. I would drop that part. Oh, you're ad homing me. <sighs> Whatever. If you, I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no standards here. You can use ad hom against uh, Augustine all you want. But when someone turns around and says, you know, you might want to drop that because it's not really relevant and you're in the same boat. Well, then you're just being mean to me. Then, well, I'm, well, I am the big meanie weenie anyways, aren't I? So that's, that's sort of the, sort of the thing. So what everybody on Twitter says.